This is my first video update for Wednesday coming to you from Athens, Greece. You can hear the sounds of cicadas, of course. You can hear the sound of, of birds and parrots and uh, pigeons and just all kinds of uh, wildlife and insects around me. But uh, let's talk about some news and let's talk about travel. Let's talk about the travel ban which is now getting even closer, an EU travel ban on Russian tourists, specifically the plan from Poland that they're floating is the, uh, the, the canceling of the visa facilitation agreement between Russia and the EU. And that facilitation agreement, as I explained in a video I did yesterday, basically that visa facilitation agreement allowed Russian citizens to travel to the European Union by obtaining a multi-entry, multi-year Schengen visa, which meant that Russians for a time period of one, three or five years were able to travel to the European Union for 90 days, for a 90 day period, every 180 days. Now this 90 day period, it did not have to be consecutive. You were uh, able to visit the European Union for one month and then you could leave the European Union for a month and then return for a 90 day period for a 180 day period. And so this was uh, this was dubbed a visa facilitation agreement. Now, um, Russia has the same type of visa facilitation agreement in place with the European Union, which means that EU passport holders were able and still are able to travel to Russia, obtain a multi entry, multi year visa and travel to Russia for uh, a time period of 90 days every 180 days. And as I said, uh, with the, with the um, time spent in Russia, it doesn't have to be consecutive. You're able to spend one month in Russia, leave Russia for one month, and then return for Russia within a 180 day period. After the 100 and 180 day period, the, uh, the visa resets. And so you have another 90 days for 180 days. And that's how this visa agreement worked. Well, Poland's plan is to do away with this facilitation agreement. Their plan is to get uh, Russian nationals, Russian travelers to uh, to be able to only get uh, a visa with a hard entry date and a hard exit date. And this visa would be for a time period of no more than 30 days. So you would actually go to, say, the uh, the embassy of Finland in Moscow or the consulate in uh, St. Petersburg, and you would apply for a visa. You would say, I want to travel to Finland for two weeks. Your entry date is this day. Your exit date is this day. And if you wanted to travel to Finland again, well, you would have to go through the entire process again, all the paperwork, the documentation, visiting the embassy paying the visa fee, the 40 or 50 euro, 60 euro fee, whatever it is, you would have to go through that process all again from the beginning. And this is a major pain in the butt. And this will discourage a lot of Russian travelers from visiting the EU. And that is the purpose behind this plan being floated by Poland. It's kind of a de facto way of, it's kind of a sneaky way of banning Russian travelers to the EU without just having the guts to say, you know what, as the European Union, we, uh, we don't like Russian travelers, we're bigots, we're racists, we despise Russia and its people, and therefore we are going to be um, cutting off Russian travelers from entering the EU. So it's kind of a sneaky way of, uh, of accomplishing that without just having the guts to coming out and saying as much because then the EU can say, well, we're doing away with, um, with multi-entry, multi-year visas. But if you're Russian, you can still travel to the EU with a one-time entry visa for 30 days. So it's kind of, you know, it's, it's a sneaky way, which is how the EU usually operates. It's a sneaky way of uh, banning Russian travel. And that's the plan that Poland is, uh, is proposing. Well, Finland, They've decided to, uh, to inch closer to this plan. And uh, we already know that Estonia is, uh, is banning Russian travelers from entering Estonia with an Estonian-issued Schengen visa. Well, Finland, 
they're, they're kind of uh, moving closer to the Polish model. And they have decided, the foreign ministry has announced, that uh, Finland will cut the number of entry visas available to Russians in half. And they are going to take the number of visas that they issue daily, which right now is a thousand visas issued daily, and they're going to cut that amount of visas down to 500 visas issued daily. Not only are they going to cut it in half, but the Finnish foreign ministry said that out of those 500 visas that they will be issuing to Russians, only 100 of those visas will be tourist visas. The other 400 are going to be visas for workers, students, and Russians with family in Finland. The Finnish ministry said that these quotas may be changed at a later date, i.e. if they get their uh, Schengen visa travel ban, then you're going to have uh, no multi-entry, multi-pass visas issued by the uh, Finnish foreign ministry. And Finland said, and I quote, that they support the complete suspension of visa facilitation agreement between the EU and Russia of the visa facilitation agreement between EU and Russia. So that basically is uh, saying that Finland is on board with Poland's plan. And uh, so is Estonia, Latvia, Lithuania, Czech Republic. Those are the countries that would like to see the visa facilitation agreement banned. Um, we have some holdout EU member states like Greece, Italy, Spain, uh, Germany, and I believe France as well. Those are the countries that are not fully on board with banning the multi-entry, uh, multi, multi-year Schengen visa. But as I said in my video yesterday, these are countries that are run by very weak leaders. And I believe there's a 50% chance that the hysteria and the EU's hatred and bigotry and racism towards Russia and its people may take over the the leaders of uh, Greece and um, Germany and Italy and Spain and, uh, and France, it may overwhelm them and they may actually agree to this uh, Polish uh, plan. I also believe that this has a 50% chance of going through this visa ban because Europe has nothing left in their next uh, sanctions package. They don't have any more sanctions to levy on Russia. They have failed. Every sing single sanction they've placed on Russia has actually boomeranged back to hurt EU citizens more than it has hurt Russia. The sanctions have actually hurt the EU more than they've hurt uh, Russia. So the EU, knowing that it has lost the economic war of attrition and also knowing that they're losing the war on the ground, the, the NATO proxy war on the ground in Ukraine, I think there, there's a good chance that uh, the Brussels elite and the leaders of uh, EU member states will just fall back on uh, on hatred and uh, and bigotry. You know, you just fall back to the most basic core uh, principle as to why you are uh, waging this war against Russia, which is not to um, not to protect Ukraine, not to save Ukraine. It has nothing to do with that. At the end of the day, at the most core, at the at the most basic, foundational. Uh, principle or value, this, uh, this war against Russia being, uh, being waged by the EU towards Russia is really about uh, Europe's historic, the European elite's historic hatred for Russia and its people. At, I, I mean, what was the two-week shock and awe economic war aimed at doing. It was aimed at creating a regime change in, uh, in the Kremlin and that regime change eventually leading to the breakup of the Russian Federation, dissecting the Russian Federation, balkanizing the Russian Federation. Chaos for the Russian people, dissecting Russia, uh, destroying Russia, destroying its identity, its culture and history, its history. That was what uh, the initial plan on February 24th with the economic shock and awe was all about. So there's a 50% chance that the EU may actually adopt Poland's proposal. Finland is already moving closer to that proposal. They're basically saying, um, if you really want to travel to Finland and you're a Russian citizen, well, we're gonna make it really, really difficult for you. And uh, if you want to travel to Finland multiple times, well, 
you're going to you're going to have to go through the visa issuance issuance process over and over and over again eventually russian tourists are going to say you know what screw it <laughs> screw it i don't maybe i'll go to europe once for two weeks maybe i'll go to finland for a two-week period but after that it's just better for me to travel to turkey or asia or serbia or uh, other places that actually want me that actually want my uh my business and my uh and, and and my being there that actually want me to visit to visit them so that is uh the plan that that uh, finland is putting forward that is the plan that poland is putting forward now russia has three options because this is a visa facilitation agreement which means that it's two ways uh the eu has this visa this multi-entry multi-year visa for russian citizens and because it's an agreement Russia has the same visa in place for EU passport holders visiting Russia. So Russia can retaliate if and when this Polish uh, plan is approved. If it's approved, Russia can either reciprocate and do exactly what the EU is doing to Russia. They could do the same and ban the multi, multi-entry, multi-year visa to Russia for EU passport holders. They can do that. They can do nothing. They can just leave the visa as is and, and just do nothing about it. As a matter of fact, Russia even has a visa right now, an electronic visa, which, uh, which, which is free actually, which you can apply for online for various uh, cities and oblasts in Russia. You can apply online and you're allowed entry into the Russian Federation for a time period of two weeks, but just to that city. So you can apply online for an, uh, for an electronic visa to visit, say, St. Petersburg, and you're allowed 14 days. I think it's 14 or 16 days in St. Petersburg, but only St. Petersburg, and it's an electronic visa. You don't have to visit an embassy. You know, there's, there's none of that stuff, and there's no fees to pay. So they actually, Russians have even, they've even made it a little bit easier to uh, visit Russia with this electronic visa, but, the other step that Russia can take, which is what I think the Russian foreign ministry should do, is that they should make it even easier for EU passport holders to visit Russia. I would suggest that the Russian foreign ministry, and if you're listening to me, uh, Mr. Lavrov, I believe that instead of retaliating tit for tat with the EU and doing exactly what the EU is doing, doing the same, I think Russia should say, you know what? We have such a kick-ass country. Moscow is such a kick-ass city. St. Petersburg is such an awesome city. Kazan, Ekaterinburg, uh, uh, where else? Varonish, uh, Rostov, uh, all these places are so awesome to visit that we're going to extend the electronic visa, this free electronic visa, for 30 days. Or we are going to make it so that EU citizens can get a one-year visa to visit Russia, and the only thing that you have to do is leave Russian territory once for one day every three or six months. That would be a cool visa. So you get a one-year visa, you pay, I don't know, say 80 euros, you get a one-year visa to visit Russia, multi-entry visa, and the only requirement is that every three months you have to leave the Russian territory for one day, and then you can re-enter. That would be the plan because, uh, you know, what do you want if you're Russia? How do you fight this war of, uh, of hatred and ignorance? Well, you show the people of the EU that Russia is an awesome place to visit and you make it easier for them to visit Russia. And why do I say this? Because the UK, during the World Cup in 2018 that Russia hosted, the UK government, they... Uh, they launched a very nasty ad campaign trying to discourage uh, UK football fans from visiting Russia and going to see the World Cup. I mean, the UK government, they were really, really nasty in the smear tactics that they employed against Russia in order to make it seem that Russia was this backwards, dangerous, uh, dirty um, place for, for UK tourists to visit. And they went full hilt uh, to try and discourage uh, UK travelers to visit Russia for the World Cup. 
But you know what? A lot of UK football fans, they ignored the, uh, the propaganda campaign from the UK government. And they went to Russia and uh, they saw the World Cup. They saw their team play in the World Cup. They visited Moscow. They visited St. Petersburg. They visited all the other cities that were hosting World Cup uh, matches. And you want to know what the UK uh, football fans, the tourists that visited Russia, said uh, with regards to Russia? They said, this country is awesome. They said these cities that they watched the football matches were awesome. They said that Russia organized an incredibly successful World Cup. They noted how clean and safe and welcoming Russia was. And this really pissed off the UK elite. I mean, it really pissed them off. I mean, they were fuming at, 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 uh, at this revelation from UK travelers to Russia. And so, long story short, if and when the EU decides to go full hatred towards the Russian people and pass this, uh, approve this visa, travel ban i think russia the easy thing for russia to do would be to to reciprocate in kind tit for tat but i think what the russian foreign ministry should do and mr lavrov if you're watching this video <laughs> if there's a chance a 0.001 percent chance that you're watching this video i would i would tell you i would urge you i would advise you to not take the bait don't respond to the eu's bigot and hatred with uh with the same measures as a matter of fact um, show, uh, show kindness towards the European people and show them that Russia welcomes you to Russia, wants you to travel to Russia, and wants you to see how, uh, how great a place Russia is to visit and make it easier for European Union citizens to do that. Kill them with kindness. That's the term that I want. Kill them with kindness. Anyway, um... Sticking with travel bans, Ukraine and Elensky, he's put a travel ban on military aged men, 18 to 60, from not being able to leave Ukraine. <laughs> what does that tell you? Ukraine President Elensky has announced that men without military experience will be banned from leaving the country as long as martial law is in effect. The statement was posted on the president's website on Monday in response to a petition urging that men between the ages of 18 and 16 be allowed to travel abroad. Now, there was a petition that was uh, put out on the internet. It got over, I believe, 27,000 signatures. Yes, over 27,000 signatures signed the petition. The petition said that uh, the Kiev government should allow military-aged men to leave the country, and they said it would be good for Ukraine because these men would be able to work uh, outside of Ukraine and then send money back to Ukraine, which would help the economy. And um, if you have, according to the Ukraine constitution, if you have more than 27,000 signatures to a petition, then the government has to take a look at the petition and take it into consideration. Well, Lenski took it into consideration and he said, tough luck. We have employed martial law. And according to the Ukraine constitution, if you have martial law, I'm sorry, over 25,000 signatures, then the government has to take a look at it. But uh, Elensky said, uh, according to the Ukraine constitution, if the government employs uh, restrictions due to emergencies, well, then it uh, supersedes these types of uh, petitions. And so because Ukraine has instituted martial law, as a matter of fact, I think a week or two ago, they re-approved the martial law that they had in place. They, uh, they extended it. So if you have martial law, then uh, um, military-aged fighting men, they cannot leave the country. And so Olensky posted on the website, tough luck to any men that are 18 to 60. You have to stay in Ukraine and we are going to, uh, to draft you. We are going to recruit you into the military sooner or later to send you to the front lines in Donbass to face the heavy rain of Russian artillery. Unless, of course, you're Petro Poroshenko and his family or Ukraine elite and their family, then if you're a military aged uh, young male, you are allowed to uh, travel to London or anywhere else, the United States and uh, and avoid military service. So um, 
That is the travel ban being instituted by the Alensky regime. It reminds me of uh, that system of a down song where they say, why does the poor always have to fight their wars? Why do the poor always have to fight the wars? So uh, another interesting law that, uh, that the Alensky regime has implemented, and this is coming from a tweet from the Kiev Independent, they are saying, receiving and distributing Russian humanitarian aid in occupied territories is to be considered uh, collaborationism. The law on collaborationism came into force on August 16th. According to it, acts of collaborationism will be punished by up to 15 years in prison. So this means that any Ukrainians in, uh, quote, quote, occupied territory as the Olensky regime would claim. So any Ukrainian citizens in, uh, in the Donbass, in Zaporozhye, in Kherson, that, uh, that need food, that need medicine, and they only have Russia to give them that food and medicine, they face 15 years in prison. So that is the, uh, the Alensky regime that the entire European Union, I'll speak for Greece and Cyprus, this is the Alensky regime that Greece and Cyprus are uh, willing to destroy their economies for. And I say that as, as someone who's in Greece and uh, someone who's, who's from Cyprus. So that is the government. That is the human rights, European values, democratic government that uh, the people of Greece and the people of Cyprus are going to be suffering for this winter and have been suffering for um, throughout the, uh, the entire conflict, the special military operation war in Ukraine. Um, a government that uh, will now imprison the very citizens that, it's, that it claims it wants to liberate if they decide to take food from uh, Russian humanitarian aid. So now let's talk about, before we get to our clown world, let's talk about the sabotage that, uh, that took place in Crimea. Now this, uh, this sabotage took place in a city known as, where is it? Uh, an incident on Tuesday morning that resulted in explosions at a military site in Northern Crimea was an intentional act according to the Russian Defense Ministry in the city of, of Maskoye. Maskoye. Uh, it was indeed sabotage according to the Russian Defense Ministry describing its response. The ministry said it was taking necessary measures to eliminate the consequences of the sabotage. The explosions caused damage to a number of civilian objects, including power lines, a power station, a railroad, and several residential houses. So uh, the, the explosions that took place in uh, Moscoye were indeed sabotage. This, uh, I think this pretty much confirms that what happened, for the most part, what happened in Crimea at uh, Novo Fedorovka at, uh, at the airbase, the, the Saki, the Saki airbase, what happened there, I think we can chalk up to sabotage as well. I, I noted as much in a video I did last week. I said, most likely it's sabotage. And sure enough, that's what it looks like. This incident has been confirmed at sabotage. We also had an incident that took place in Sevastopol where uh, a drone exploded in the, um, I believe in the mayor's, the mayor's headquarters as well. And so what I said in my video last week, I'm just gonna say it again in this video, and that is that uh, as Ukraine continues to lose this war, they are going to revert to, uh, to sabotage. This is common. This is nothing unusual. Um, Russia, the Russian military, the people of Russia, they should uh, prepare for more types of sabotage events. It's unfortunate. Uh, maybe a sabotage event may result in something tragic. Uh, maybe the Russian authorities will be able to uh, to uh, eliminate saboteurs as well, hunt them down and eliminate them, which I'm sure they will over time. For example, Russia has dismantled uh, Hizub, uh, Hizub Ut Tahir cell coordinated by Ukraine and Crimea, according to federal se se security services. Uh, so they've already 
managed according to this uh to this news headline they've already managed to to catch one of the the saboteur cells in crimea as russia uh, works over time to eliminate these cells these types of sabotage events are going to happen and um it's just part of the the conflict part of the war that i think um you know people are going to have to just accept over time over a year or two um russia will get a handle on these sabotage events but uh you know the the sabotage events that took place in um in the crimea uh military ammo depots and military air base these are concerning because it means that russia needs to beef up the security at these air bases and so this is a cause of concern but the sabotage events taking place i think are something that uh unfortunately we're going to start to see a lot of especially as the ukraine military continues to lose the conflict in ukraine they're going to revert to uh to sabotage and uh, terrorist acts so um that is what i have to say with that news item and should we get to our clown world um by the way uh this i'll have two stories for clown world by the way the ft is running an article saying how the eu is absolutely furious with turkey because turkey is trading a lot with russia and this kind of goes to the travel ban because you're going to see a lot of russians now traveling to turkey uh, a whole lot of Russians are going to be traveling to Turkey because it's going to be easy to travel to Turkey now and they're not going to be allowed or it'll be more difficult to travel to the European Union. So Turkey is definitely benefiting from all of the EU sanctions. And this is making the EU, the kleptocrats in Brussels, really pissed off. And the Financial Times is saying that the kleptocrats in Brussels, they're uh, saying that this cooperation between Turkey and Russia is not right and it's not really appropriate. But they also acknowledge that there is little they can do about it. Yeah, absolutely. There's little, little that they can do about it because Turkey has shown that it's a very clever country. It's positioned itself in a very clever way with regards to the special military operation, this conflict. Um, it's also shown that it's a sovereign country and it's not going to be pressured by NATO or the European Union or the United States. It's going to make sovereign decisions that are in its economic and sovereign best interests. And one of those decisions is to continue to cooperate with Russia. Not only cooperate with Russia, they've actually positioned themselves as a neutral mediator as well. Uh, Erdogan, I believe, is going to be traveling to Lviv and he's going to meet with Alensky and Gutierrez. They're going to talk about the grain uh, exports, um, but they're also going to talk about, I'm sure, trying to figure out a way to uh, get Alensky to surrender. Uh, no doubt about it that Turkey's going to try to to figure things out there. And I'm not, I'm not I'm not saying Turkey's been perfect. You know, Turkey sold drones to Ukraine, and supposedly they're going to be producing drones with Russia. So Turkey has, well, you know, their arms industry has played both sides. No doubt about that. Turkey has started to stir up more trouble in Syria, and this is a point of uh, of, of of tension with Russia. So Turkey has not has not been, you know, completely neutral, but. They figured out ways to walk that line very carefully and they've done it with skill and success. And now the EU is pissed off at them. You know, I find the EU, they're just such children. Just so I understand, the EU is upset that Turkey continues to trade and do business with Russia uh, after the EU decided to shoot themselves in both feet, in the lungs and in the head by imposing sanctions on Russia and given the fact that Turkey has been a candidate country for the EU for 30 plus years, and they've been getting continuous, continuously snubbed by the European Union for those 30 years to enter the EU. And now the EU has the, the gall, the audacity, the hypocrisy to be upset with Turkey because it's pursuing its best interests. <laughs> it's just, I'm telling you, the EU, the European Union, the people that run the European Union are just such freaking children spoiled uh pampered elite children unbelievable 30 years you've had uh, turkey as a candidate country 30 years and now you're upset that they're uh, doing business with russia and uh to make things even even worse for the eu turkey i bet you doesn't even want to join the eu anymore they realize what a corrupt 
uh, backwards authoritarian uh, institution the EU has become. And I'm sure that Turkey now, if they were given the opportunity to join the European Union, they would snub the EU. They would tell the EU, no thanks. But uh, 30 years, you've kept them in a holding pattern. And how come the EU never decided to sanction Turkey for the, uh, for the occupation of Northern Cyprus? If, if we're talking about being, uh, being all about human rights and uh, democracy and, and uh, sanctioning countries that, uh, that go against the territorial integrity of, uh, of EU member states that impede on the territorial integrity on EU member states. Cyprus is a member of the European Union and the EU has an imposed sanctions on Turkey. Ukraine is not a member of the European Union, but yet the EU imposed sanctions on Russia. To make matters even worse, Greece has voted for those sanctions against Russia and Greece hasn't done anything to help uh, uh, get sanctions on Turkey because of the Cyprus problem. Anyway, I could go on and on and on. You know what? Good on you, Turkey. Good on you. I'm saying that as a Greek and as a Cypriot. You're doing what you need to do with regards to Russia and let the European Union pound sand and let them, let them give out these little statements to the Financial Times and talk about how this is not right and how this is inappropriate for you to do business with Russia. Anyway, let's do our two clown worlds. The first clown world has to do with uh, Ukraine, Kiev, the Alensky regime. They are removing a plaque to the novelist and playwright Mikhail Bulgakov. The master in Margarita. This is a plaque that was put up in, uh, I believe, in Kiev, in the National University in Kiev in 2017. It was taken down from the Taras Shevchenko National University in Kiev. Ukraine activists campaigned against the Kiev-born author, celebrated Monday's move as a triumph over Russian occupation. Bulgakov is a symbol of Russian culture and had nothing to do with the Ukrainian one. Quite the contrary. In his works, he denigrated everything Ukrainian, it said Tatiana. Uh, Shuvchenko, an activist from the Expert Corps NGO, which petitioned for the plaque's removal. Oh, great. So Ukraine has been infested with all of these activist NGO types, and that is why you're seeing this. And they remove a plaque to one of the greatest novelists of all time, of all history. I mean, The Master and Margarita is uh, a masterpiece. A masterpiece. And uh, you should be proud that Bulgakov was born in, uh, in Ukraine. I didn't know he was born in Ukraine. You should be proud of that. You should be celebrating that. A plaque, you should have statues of, uh, of Bulgakov. But nope, can't do it because he promotes Russian culture, not Ukrainian. Ukrainian culture is Russian culture, you <laughs> How can you deny your history? If you deny your history, you have nothing. You don't exist if you deny your history. Even if you don't like your history, you can't wash it away. It's reality. Look at that parakeet. Hey, buddy. Beautiful, huh? Beautiful. <laughs> All right, so that's my first clown world. You get rid of Bulgakov, a plaque. Anyway, you can't build a, a, a country. You can't build a country on hatred for another country. That's not how you can build a society, a country, a functioning country, a country, culture, and identity. You can't build that based on hatred of another country. That's not, that's not a proper foundation. It just doesn't work. Anyway, um, Liz Cheney, my final clown world, Liz Cheney. I'm not gonna get into it. She lost in Wyoming, hooray, but Liz Cheney will, uh, she will get a promotion, even though she won't be in Congress. Believe me, she will get promoted up. That's what always happens to these incompetent 
globalist elitist type. Ursula van der Crazy, Christine Lagarde, uh, Borrell, Liz Cheney will get promoted up. I don't know as what. She may uh, get some nice book deals. She may become a director of a think tank. Maybe the Biden administration will appoint her in his cabinet. Maybe she'll become secretary of state and they'll get rid of Blinken or they'll move Blinken somewhere else. Who knows? Who knows? But she will get promoted up. She knew she was going to lose. The deep state knew that she was going to lose. Uh, the Democrats who are supporting her, they knew she was going to lose. That's why she did campaign. And I am certain that they have uh, other plans for her because she is deep state royalty. I mean, she's the daughter of Darth Vader, Dick Cheney. Um, so she is she's worth something like 44, 45 million. But she will uh, get promoted up. I don't know in what form she'll get promoted up, but the clown world has to deal with. Well, first, let me read you Trump's uh, statement after the election was called, and then I'll read you and I'll put on the screen a Babylon B headline, and that is the clown world. So Trump said this. He said, congratulations to, to Harriet uh, Hageman on her great and very decisive win in Wyoming. This is a wonderful result for America and a complete rebuke of the unelected committee of political hacks and thugs. Liz Cheney should be ashamed of herself, the way she acted and her spiteful, sanctimonious words and actions towards others. Now she can finally disappear into the depths of political oblivion, where I am sure she will be much happier than she is right now. Thank you, Wyoming. So that is Trump's statement. Uh, unfortunately, she's not going to disappear. She's going to, uh, they'll put her somewhere, somewhere. They will use her somehow and in some way. Um, here is the, here's the clown world. Here is the, uh, the headline from the Babylon B from the Babylon B. And this is fantastic. Let me put it on the screen. Never has America faced a greater threat than Donald Trump says a guy who started two wars and shot a dude in the face. <laughs> that was from a video statement from Dick Cheney, where he was, uh, urging people in Wyoming to vote for his daughter, Liz. But I, I, I think that headline from the Babylon Bee is brilliant. Yeah, Dick Cheney started the Iraq War. He started the Afghanistan War. He started all kinds of wars and conflicts. And he shot his best friend in the face. That is true. And uh, he is about as deep state as you can get. He is Darth Vader of deep state. That is uh, Dick Cheney. And uh, Liz Cheney, well, she was put in office because she is Dick Cheney's daughter. Plain and simple. That's the only reason she is where she is. And uh, they're going to find a place to, uh, to put her, no doubt about it. So I'm going to leave it there, everybody, theduran.locals.com. Check out Alexandra's channel. Check out the Duran's channel, Odyssey, BitChute, Rumble, Telegram, and Duran's shop. 10% off. Use the code. Good day. Take care.